It comes from Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Thank you. feel they're overlooked. Maybe they've been slighted. Maybe um, they just feel like nobody seems to notice or care. And uh, at some point in time, some of these folks have said, wait a minute. We matter, right? Our lives matter, who we are, what we represent, it matters. And so I wanted us to, today to stop and think about something that maybe we take a little bit for granted. Maybe we haven't really thought much about it. Maybe it's lost some of its luster. And I want us to think about, does membership in the church matter? Let's pray. Gracious God, as we have gathered here this morning in this house of worship, I ask that you would help us to pause and reflect over our time here, however long it's been, and ask ourselves, does it matter if I'm a member or not? Does it matter that I'm part of this church or not? And perhaps if we will listen, your Holy Spirit can help us answer that question as to whether membership matters. Be with us in this study time. I ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. I've wrestled with this for a while. Uh, I guess when it first came, became a priority for me was when I was a lay pastor in California. So I worked at the hospital my 40 hours during the week. I was on call um, in the hospital on a beeper, so I'd go, be called in at night. And uh, I was asked to uh, take the lead, much like Jeff does here at our church, um, and just kind of keep things organized and running and preaching and teaching and all of those things. And um, I'd been a member growing up in the church all, all my life, but it wasn't until I felt that sense of responsibility for the church that I began to wonder and think about this thing called membership. So um, I'm just going to ask very briefly, how many of you have been members of the church uh, less than a year? Less than a year. Okay, okay, we've got a couple people like that. Okay. How many have been a member of the church for five years or less? Okay, ten years. Feel like, feel like the auctioneer now. Ten years, huh? Fifteen. Twenty. Twenty-five. Thirty. Thirty-five. Forty. Forty-five. Fifty. I'm going to stop right there. Okay, if it's fifty or more, put your hand up. Okay, all right. Okay. So, if you've been a member of this church for a long time, 
I would imagine that if there's anybody I could ask about membership, it would be you folks. Now, I'll cut a little slack for the newbies, okay? They're maybe still figuring it out. But how about for the rest of us? Does it matter that we're members? Does it make any difference? What is membership anyway? And I did it to myself again. Um, my type is so small there, it's going to be hard for me to read it from here, but I'll see what I can, see what I can do. Let me pull it, up on my, pull it up on my iPad. And I probably need to turn on the mic, right, Dave? Probably would, probably would help. Right? Are we good? Oh, okay. All right. I'll be retiring in January, and I think my eyes are already tiring um, and retiring. So, apologize for that, but I'll pull it up where I can read it. All right. So on my slide it says, "What is membership?" And I'll, I tried to look it up online, get some ideas of, um, you know from people who are experts in this area. And the definition of membership was a commitment by like-minded individuals to engage with or further interest in a shared activity, profession, or mission. So it sounds like people that are all on the same page. Is that kind of, if I was to boil it down, that's what it kind of sounds like. It's a membership is a commitment by people that have some shared values, some shared interests, and want to work together, uh, whether that's their job or their church. Okay? And to try to get it, put it in a more of a religious context, uh, church membership is implied in the biblical requirement of all Christians to be submitted to a group of church leaders, elders, and pastors. That's all through the Bible, folks. We can, we can just go right through there. And, and Paul especially um, was talking to Timothy and others about the importance of deacons and bishops and elders in the church um, and, and their roles and the need for everyone to, to uh, follow their leadership. So what does church membership actually do? Church membership will provide a Christian with a number of blessings. Number of blessings. I almost sang count your many blessings today. All right. A number of blessings. What are some of those? Well, spiritual accountability. Does that sound about right? Is the church here to help us hold ourselves accountable spiritually? Is it an opportunity to connect us more intimately with the body of Christ? Or opening up greater opportunities for us to serve and to be served. Does that sound, sound about right for a church? Okay. Some spiritual accountability. Connecting with others in a more intimate way. Getting to know people better um, within the body of Christ. And also giving us opportunities to serve others and, and to be served ourselves when we have times of need. But I like this last sentence. But joining a church should not be only about what you will gain. You see, we live in a society now, a postmodern society, where the focus is really on the individual. What's important for you? How do you feel? And the church as a whole, Christianity as a whole, at least here in North America, has really fallen into that consumerist concept of church. Let's just find out what everybody wants and let's just give it to them. And that will make everybody happy. That will make them show up at church and make them feel like they're part of things and make us look successful. And that's great. But is that really how church should be? There was a pastor of a large um, non-denominational church in California near Sacramento, was, his church was like partway between Sacramento and San Francisco, that, that general area there. And um, at his, the height of its popularity, he had five to 10,000 people showing up every Sunday, uh, Saturday and Sunday, uh, for his church services. And um, 
He was a master, he said, at entertainment. Every Sunday they had a, like a, a show on the, on the stage. They would act out uh, parables of Jesus or other kinds of things. Um, and it was just like going to a theater almost. Of course, the music was uh, the upbeat contemporary music of the day. And uh, people were just flocking to his church. But as he sat down and talked to the leadership of his church, they all, with one voice, said there was an emptiness that they were feeling um, in this consumeristic mentality of just let's give the people whatever's going to entertain them, make them happy to come here. They had lots of different services and outreaches of the church. Um, but what really kind of struck home, he said to him, was when he was standing at the front of the church, uh, or at the back of the church, however you want to look at it, after a service, a lady came up to him and said, you know, I like your church, but um, I wish you had a choir. Well, choir music wasn't quite what they were doing at that church. And so he pointed out to them, well, yes, uh, you know, uh, we don't have a choir. Um, she says, yeah, I know. She says, and that's why I'm going to that church across town. Because they have a choir. And he stopped and thought about it. Is all that this woman cared about was whether they had a choir or not. She didn't care whether the messages were spiritual. She didn't care if there was um, exemplary Christian service being offered to the community or anything like that. All she was interested in is, do you have a choir? If you don't have a choir, I'm out of here. He began to rethink his church and began to realize that he needed to remove that consumer uh, attitude from how they were ministering to their people. He lost a lot of members to that church across town. But he said he felt better about it because he felt like the people that were there were there for the right reasons. You know, sometimes we can fall into that same trap, don't you think? Start thinking about what's the church doing for me? How do I feel? Is it meeting my needs? And if not, eh, maybe I'm not going to be uh, so hooked in. I'm not going to join the church. Membership. How important is it? We'll move to our next slide here. I've asked a few questions, made a few statements here that I want us to think about. Why should membership even matter? Is it a requirement in Scripture? Does the Bible somewhere say you need to be a member of the church or you can't go to heaven? You need to be a member of the church or you can't be saved? And when you get down to it, what difference does it really make if I'm a member or not? Some people seem to feel it's more trouble than it's worth. You go to a church, you become a member of the church, and then there's all the, all the uh, drama and things that go on, and you wonder, is it really worth it? Is it really worth it? Maybe I'll just stay home, and I can just worship at home. Anyways, can't I serve the church without my name being in some book somewhere? Somebody writing it down and saying I'm a member, and if they were to ask, they can look in the book and say, yeah, yeah, I see, I see that person's name. Yeah, they're, they're a member of our church. Is that really what membership is all about, having your name registered in, in a book somewhere? Another thing that often is said, I just don't like the hypocrisy, the controlling spirit that other members display. They want to run everything. Or they want to be a kingly power. Or maybe they're a bit of a hypocrite. They say one thing but do something else. And I'm tired of it. Right? I don't want any part of that. And then for some, the reluctance is, well, I'm just not sure I need the added responsibilities that come with being a member. After all, I'd have to show up at work bees, wouldn't I? 
So I want us to think about our membership uh, in four steps this morning. For us here as a local church, what is our message? What is our mission? Why are we here? Why is Pittsburgh Church here? What's it for? The four areas I want us to think about is first that it, it starts with me. The word member, the first two letters are M-E. Kind of starts with me. We're going to look at that. Membership also gives us the concept of being a family. One great family, the church. You know, what's, what I've always found fascinating is um, we studied from the Sabbath School quarterly here this morning, but if we would have gone to South Africa or um, India or Russia or anywhere else in the globe, they'd be studying the same, the same passages, the same scriptures. One great family. And then thirdly, um, I want us to think about Adventist care. We care about each other. We care about our communities. Um, we've... Uh, here is our small church, done what we can to collect things for the local schools, and now that there's issues going on in the mountains, uh, trying to collect and, and to share things there um, as a church as we can. Isn't that right? And then last but not least, membership has something to do with leading the way. Our church has always been founded on the idea of, of pioneers, blazing trails, spreading the message, leading the way. And so um, I want to kind of look at some of these topics here um, today. Let's start with the first one. Why should our membership matter? Why, why should you be a member? When asked what benefit a church member receives that a non-member doesn't, many people are left scratching their heads. Right? Think about it. Anybody's allowed to attend Sabbath morning services, right? We don't uh, card people at the door or make sure, you know, that you've got, you've got your dues paid and, and you're good. No, any, anyone can, can come in. Um, anyone's allowed to visit, attend any of our small groups like our um, midweek services. Um, anyone's welcome to put something in the plate. We passed it. To everybody, right? We didn't say, well, just only members have to put something in there. Everybody else, uh, no thanks. Or how about special church events? I know we're planning a, a picnic here um, next, not, not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow. Uh, no, two weeks, sorry, two weeks from tomorrow. And everybody's invited. And you can bring a friend. You don't have to be a member of the church. So if a non-member can enjoy all the things that all the rest of us enjoy. What's the sense of having membership? What's that really mean? And you know what? For some people, the only reason for church membership they can come up with is that it's required in order for you to sit on the board or, or committee or something. And you probably would find out if that was the main thing, uh, most people wouldn't want to join the church. Right? And most people, yeah, I'll pass. Right? And then there's those who will say, well, you know, the Bible doesn't require that you be a member of any particular church. It's not anywhere in there, but I'll be honest with you, it's simply not true. The Bible talks about the importance of us being part of a church. So while there's no Bible verse that will command you and say, thou shalt be a member of the church, when we look at the weight of the evidence in Scripture, it'll be clear that being a member of a local church is something that is understood in scriptures, it's encouraged, it's also assumed. So, it starts with me. Each member needs to take ownership and responsibility for doing the right thing. Does that make sense? You know, some people are just finding their way, um, the way in Christianity, they're just learning about the gospel. They don't really understand the concepts. Uh, Paul talks about the milk, right? And he encouraged people 
to sink their teeth into the meat of God's word. I would be remiss if I didn't have us turn in our, in our Bibles, so I would like you to turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Where Paul addresses this uh, need for us to take some ownership and responsibility for doing what's right. Colossians chapter 1, starting with verse 9 and down through verse 12. Colossians 1, 9 to 12. Paul says, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Paul doesn't say he's going to do it for them. He doesn't say that, uh, you know, you just read, read this book and, and you're good. He encourages them to obtain spiritual knowledge and understanding and then to put it into practice, to um, be partakers of the inheritance of the saints, to participate in what is happening. It's important for us as members of the church to realize that what the church is and what the church does starts with me. Not the guy in the pew across from me, not the guy up front or in the back, but it begins with me. If we can make it a personal thing, if we can personalize our membership, I think we'll value it much more and we'll see that it will give us much more. The second part about it starts with me it's found in Timothy, advice that Paul was giving to Timothy. We can find that in 2 Timothy, chapter 2. 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verses 24 through 26. He said, And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snares of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. In verse 15, we read, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, Rightly dividing the word of truth. We need to empower each other and trust each other as we walk through um, the Christian life together. Because there are potholes in the road. And sometimes our eyes get distracted. And we'll step into one of those and trip and fall. And that's where we need to trust each other. To work with each other to meet these challenges that our church faces. Folks, I don't know how in tune you are with what's going on in our church, as a world church, as a church here in North America, uh, the challenges that uh, leadership has and the challenges that, that uh, some local churches are facing, but they're there and they're real. And it's real easy sometimes to armchair quarterback and say, well, they could have done this, they should have done that. If it would have been me, I would have done it this way. And I don't understand how they can um, get up, wake up and look at themselves in the mirror, um, look at what they're doing. Paul's exhorted us here in 2 Timothy 2.25, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. And 
The servant of the Lord, verse 24, must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, and patient. You know, it's easy for us to kind of get frustrated. Could be our pastor, could be our elders, could be the person who took my favorite parking spot in the, in the parking lot out here every Sabbath. My goodness, that's my spot. I don't know why they took that spot. It's, it's interesting sometimes what happens. I remember a church my father pastored uh, almost was split down the middle when they had to decide about what color of the carpet they were going to replace was going to be. Half the church wanted blue and the other half wanted uh, burgundy red and they just could not agree. My father was almost to the point where he was ready to just say, this half will be burgundy and this half will be blue and we'll just uh, move on with it, right? Um, but it's amazing. It really is. And those of you who have been around the church long enough, trust me, you know that, right? Isn't it true? Sometimes it's the littlest, silliest stuff that gets everybody all worked up. And then what happens is we can't really meet the real challenges our church has because we're too busy not trusting each other and not willing to empower each other um, to meet those challenges. And the third point here on it starts with me. We need to support each other and hold each other accountable for the fulfillment of our mission. You know, sometimes people look and they say, you know what? I find it hard to empower and, and to trust people because when I see what, what the fruits of their experiences are, it's kind of shaky. Not so sure about this. It is important for us to hold each other accountable. Everyone needs to be held accountable especially our leaders. It's so easy for power to corrupt, right? It's so easy for us to be in charge and think we, we know everything and we've got it right and we know what's best for everybody else. And so we don't hold ourselves uh, accountable to that. But that's why we need to have the servant leader model that our conference president talks about a lot. The idea of I'm here to serve. I'm not here to you know, sit in a throne and, and tell everybody what to do. Paul, Paul speaks to this in Thessalonians. I'd like us to take a quick peek at that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Starting with verse 6. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are Typically drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together, key word, live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other, and edify one another, just as you also are doing. What does that word edify mean? Edify. To lift up, to build up. We should be looking for ways to help each other become better Christians. We should be interested in investing our time and attention into putting our brother or our sister first, ahead of us. And sometimes, that's not an easy thing for our brothers or sisters to do, to step out in faith, to do something maybe that they're reluctant to, that maybe the devil is putting pressure on them not to do. Um, there's a little saying I have that I share uh, in the potluck line downstairs when people are hanging in the back. I'll go, he who hesitates is last. Right? And so sometimes when people are hesitating at the church, they end up being last. And that's not where they need to be. So let's, let's and I don't just mean the potluck line, folks. I'm, I'm talking about other things as well. Okay? Sometimes people are a little bit hesitant to get involved in what's going on at church or to step forward and make a commitment to something that they haven't done. And when they hesitate, they get left behind. And so it's important for us to remember that... Uh, if someone is hesitating, 
Let's step behind them, give them the support that they need. They may desperately need that support. So yes, I, I put a little play on the words here. The first two letters of the word member is me, M-E. It starts with me. So if membership's going to be of any value to you or to the church, it needs to start with you. Here's a thought. As, as a person comes to faith in Christ, it's vital to their growth that they place themselves under the teaching and authority of the Word of God. And by joining a local church, each person is making a statement that they identify with a particular doctrinal position of who God is and what role his word has in their life. It's there within the body of the church that they exercise the spiritual gifts they receive from God. And that leads us to our next phase of membership. The concept of being one great family. We're stronger together than we are apart. Collaboration is a key to producing a healthy and unified church and blending our unique spiritual gifts and experiences supports the beauty of the concept many notes, one chord. Um, and I wanted to just kind of illustrate that um, here, in, if I could, with our piano for just a moment. One note. It gets boring after a while, doesn't it? So let's just switch up. And for those who want a little higher experience, one note. But when we blend the notes together, many notes, one chord. And that's how membership in the church should be. Each of us, we have our note. But let's try to blend for the harmony that comes with one chord. Just something to think about. Each of us has our own gifts that we can share, that we can bring, that God has given to us. It's important for us to blend those together with others. If if I took just one of those notes and hammered it really loud and the others much softer, it would mar the beauty of the chord. Does that make sense? And in fact, on the piano, if you want to know the truth, each one of those notes is really three strings. There's three strings, and they have to be tuned together so that it sounds beautiful. You start messing with each one of those little strings, and the next thing you know, the piano is going to sound terrible. Have you heard, heard a terrible piano, Carolee? Oh, yeah. How about you, Deb? It's terrible, right? Just, it's just bone jarring sometimes if you get on a piano like that. And what makes it even worse for the player is one of the notes decides, ah, I'm not that important. I'm not going to play. Okay? And then you're trying to play, and all of a sudden you hit that note, and it's not there. It's not there. And unless you're really accomplished where you could change keys to a different set of notes, it's just not as pretty as it could be. Is it possible as a church that I might think that my note's not all that important? I can skip out and um, nobody will notice. The music will go on and nobody will notice that um, I hit the wrong note or I skipped out. But let's remember that as a church, our, our harmony, um, the melody that we're trying to put forth is a song of glory to God. Not just in, as a music, but 
as our lives, the music of our lives. If God has given us the gift, let's don't bury it. Let's use it. Now, I remember people saying, blood is thicker than water. You ever heard that statement? statement you know, um, get in an argument with somebody, and well, if it's, if it's between your relatives and people down the street, you side with your relatives because blood is thicker than water. Am I right? But folks in the church, that doesn't, that doesn't work. Because we're all related by blood, the blood of Jesus Christ, and by the waters of baptism. So there is no blood thicker than water because we both have, we've, we've been in both as members of the church, right? So a gentleman named Mark Deaver wrote a book, Nine Marks of a Healthy Church. And this was something he wrote about church membership. Church membership is our opportunity to grasp hold of each other in responsibility and love. By identifying ourselves with a particular church, we let the pastors and other members of that local church know that we intend to be committed in attendance, in our giving, in prayer, and in service. We allow fellow believers to have great expectations of us in these areas. That's why the nominating committee goes around and wants to ask people to, to step in and help out, right? As members, we, we provide that expectation um, to others. And we assure the church of our commitment to Christ in serving with them. And in like kind, we call for their commitment to serve and encourage us as well. It's a mutual thing. There's a song that I really like. Um, it's, a, it's a choral piece, um, so I can't really do it with my guitar. It's not in the hymn book. But the concept is this. As you're sitting in the pew, and it's time for prayer, look to your right and look to your left. There's someone sitting there. You don't know what their day's like. You don't know what their life is like. It could have been hell all week. But as you look at them, pray for them. You don't know what maybe specifically to pray, but pray for that person. And the song ends up with the thought that as you pray for them, the beauty is they'll be praying for you. And isn't that what church is about? Even if we don't feel we can open up and tell others everything that's on our heart or the burdens that we're bearing or the struggles that we're facing, just knowing that sitting in the pew that the person to the right of you and the person to the left of you cares about you and is praying for you, that should be great and good news for each of us. That is something that is greater than being related by blood or by water. I labeled the next little section, practice makes perfect, and then I put a question mark. Because I don't want anybody to think I'm preaching perfection here, um, you know, the way some people think of it. But I remember my mom telling me that uh, when I didn't want to do my piano practice. She said, practice makes perfect. Here's some thoughts. Committing to your local church encourages us to love others who are not like us. Have you ever thought about that? Look around the church. Not everybody's just exactly like you. And this is especially true in a multi-ethnic or multi-racial church. But every church, no matter who it is, is going to have people who are different or people that irritate you. And you can bet that you and I will probably irritate them too, All right? And that's kind of the point. That's kind of the point here. God uses difficult people like us to bring about change in others' lives and in our lives. After all, if you think about it, one of these days, we're all gonna live in a harmonious community eternally called heaven. If we can't get along now, if we can't figure out ways to settle our differences now, heaven will be hell for eternity. So 
That's the purpose of the church, to help us kind of prepare ourselves to um, be ready to be a harmonious community eternally. And you know, it involves something that we need to recognize, the ADA. Now, I'm kind of borrowing um, this example from the American Disability Act that's passed by Congress that tells companies and corporations and hospitals that if somebody's handicapped, you can't just say, well, I'm sorry, you're handicapped. Sorry about it. No, you are supposed to look for ways to accommodate, to, to make them uh, able to function and to have the same experiences as those who do not have the disability. Well, did you know that in the church, uh, we have something called the Adventist Disabilities Act? Yeah? It's also called Laodiceanism, okay? You heard of that, right? Yeah, we have, we have disabled people in our church. I'm one of them. I'm sure if you think about it, maybe you are too. So the question is, do we accommodate each other's disability? Are we interested in finding ways to communicate through our disabilities, through our difficulties? Are we willing to do that? Because if we'll acknowledge the ADA in the SDA church, our church life, we can assist in mitigating it and eliminating it, making it more bearable. That leads to topic three, Adventists care. And I believe this is a good statement of our church. We care about our community and we care about each other. Do I hear an amen to that? Do you really believe that? Do we care about the community around us? And do we care about each other? The Bible suggests that it is our privilege to serve the people of Central Carolina. This is where we are. Yes, we can help Western Carolina with the tragedies they have. We can help folks in Israel or Ukraine or all these other places. But this is our area that God has placed us personally, physically, here in Central Carolina. And we have a privilege to serve them. It's not an obligation. It's not a duty. It's not a, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? But it should be a privilege. Adventist caring is demonstrated by kindness, compassion in every interaction, modeling Christ likeness. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them, right? Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. Lo, I'm with you always. That is what Adventist caring is about. We need to care about people, not just their physical needs. We need to care about that, but we need to go the step further. Silver and gold, perhaps I do not have, but what I do have, let me give it to you. It's free. It's yours. God offers it. I'm just a conduit. I'm just an agent. How about it? Do you care? It's important for us to become the visible body of Christ. The visible body of Christ. And so often, the image that people see is very marred. It's very um, ugly. It doesn't look very attractive at all. But we're to be his hands, are we not? We're to be his feet. We're to be his shoulder for people to cry on. Or to help carry their cross if they need it. After all, we have that biblical example. Someone helped carry Jesus' cross. Remember? Pressed into service. And he carried that cross for our Savior. Would you be willing to do that? Are you interested in becoming a visible expression of the body of Christ. For us to be a growing church, it will require involvement from the church board. Require involvement of our new pastor whenever he gets here, right? No. Growing church will require involvement from everyone. This creates a sense of ownership. As you get involved, You'll become invested in the church's mission and our vision of where we're going. 
And as you experience the transforming power of our church community, you will find that you will be able to do things in very dramatic ways that perhaps you hadn't thought of before. I have a saying that I've always uh, tried to express, especially as a leader of the church. There is something, not always the same thing, something, something has an O, same thing has an A. There's always something, may not always be the same thing for everyone to minister in the church. You know, sometimes we look to a particular program and we're going to all just like um, automatons just line up and um, work that program. And that's great. But there is room for plenty of other opportunities in the church. Things we have maybe not thought of. If God places it on your heart, then it's something. And even if everybody else is doing something else, we should be supporting and helping each other to become that visible body of Christ. Because you see, folks, evangelism is not a program. It's a lifestyle. It's not a program. It's a lifestyle. When we talk about discipleship, we're not talking about reading a book, sitting together and talking about the book. That's not what it's about. It's a lifestyle. It's a choice on our part to become more actively involved as a member of the body of Christ. Last but not least, I don't want to wear out the saints. Membership involves leading the way. As members, we should be leading the way for those who aren't members to help them understand there's value in being a member. Because, yes, like I said earlier, we can all attend church. We can all sing the songs. We can all eat at the potluck. But is that really what church is about? Is that really what our church is? Or is there more to it? You see, what makes membership valuable is we can make a difference by improving the spiritual lives of others. Improving the spiritual lives lives of others. Making disciples makes leaders. Thought about that? Making disciples makes leaders. Jesus made his disciples leaders in three and a half years. They followed him. And while they didn't have everything right, we all know that, right? They just, there are some things they just didn't understand. Yet, they became leaders each and every one. And that's what it should be here in our church. We join the church. We're here to make disciples and become leaders. How do we do that? We provide resources and encouragement for character growth. That's really what it's all about, isn't it? To grow our characters, to have our character more perfectly reflect that of Christ, to be more and more like him. That's growth. And that requires encouragement because there's a lot of discouraging things along the way when we look at our frail humanity. But as a church, we can provide resources and encouragement for that. But it requires this next item for you to buy into it and believe it. My statement here is, we believe our message is changing the world. Do you believe it? Our message is changing the world. One person at a time. One person at a time. And that is why it's important for us. How do we know to lead? Evidence-based leadership as followers of Christ. Our mission is to be disciples who make disciples. The church is a way for followers of Jesus to act together as one body with Jesus as the head to fulfill his mission. At its best, the unity in Christ we experience in our church can even give us, oh, get this, a taste of the glory to come as described in Revelation 7. Look it up this afternoon. Read it. Get inspired. Servant leadership is a style of leadership that prioritizes the needs of others over the leader's own 
priorities and is based on the example of Jesus Christ. In our church setting, servant leadership can help to create a culture of support, love, and inclusiveness while still calling for growth and change. It isn't just a bunch of feel good, let's all, all agree that we're going to agree and not disagree, but we need growth. There needs to be change in our lives. Of the 114 times in the Bible, the King James Version of the Bible, 114 times the word church or churches is used. 96 of those refer not to a global world church, but to a local church. The remaining um, 18 verses don't name a specific church, but generically it focuses um, on a local church. It's kind of an oblique reference to that. 114 times in the Bible. That sounds like a pretty good number to me. How about you? If church is that important, for it to be in the Bible that many times, I think it should be important for us as well. All right. We're not playing hangman here, but there's a couple of letters missing there in that word. So our church is empty if you are not in it. Kind of get the point? Think about it for a moment as we go to our next slide where I put the letters in. Our church is not a church if you are not in it. We need each and every one. There isn't a single person here in this room that isn't important for our church. There isn't a single person in this room that's not important for you to feel that you belong and that you can make that commitment of being a member of the body of Christ. After all, Membership matters. Let's pray. Gracious Father, I hope that uh, in these few minutes of time that I've had an opportunity to share this topic with our church, I hope that uh, it's not been lost in all the words and pictures, but that um, it will sink into our, our hearts and minds and permeate our lives that we will become members of the church, not so our name's on a book somewhere, but because we are committed to these principles of membership in your church, to make it viable, living, and active, and be able to bear one another's burdens and to help accomplish the mission that needs to be accomplished, uh, not individually, but like notes in a chord. May we make beautiful music for you. It's our prayer in Christ's name.